Well, you know, I, I uh, confession, I did not grow up with all those old gospel hymns. The hymns I grew up with were a lot older. <laughs> you know, Mighty Fortress is Our God and all those things. But I'll tell you, my time in this journey has led me to love those hymns and just love singing them. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Gospel word this morning is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Listen for God's still speaking voice speaking to your heart today. And when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry and gave you food? Or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you? Or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick, in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away, into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. May we be blessed in hearing and understanding God's holy word. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, continuing on this uh, Choose Your Own Journey sermon series where you tell me what to preach on, I was happy to receive this particular passage uh, and to ask, uh, be asked to preach on it because it's a good one. When I was born, I was the three billionth 496th millionth, 978,000th, 511th person alive on the planet. At least that's how many people were on the planet on June 5th, 1969. Now, 54 years have gone since then, and that number is more than doubled to 8 billion, 51 million, 251,598 as of several hours ago this morning. However, that number has changed because it goes up by 15,000 every hour. That's 15,000 new babies every hour, or as the song says, new sparrows for God's eye to be on. In fact, I've been preaching for about a minute, And that's 259 more babies in the world since I started preaching one minute ago. Brand new bundles of joy. And I want to put that in perspective for you. 
in 24 hours today, from midnight this morning till midnight tonight, there will be more new babies born in the world than there are people in the Evansville-Henderson metro area. Think about that. Now, here's another statistic. Before midnight strikes tonight, thousands of children around the world will die of measles and tetanus and diphtheria because they've not been treated or immunized. The antibiotic they need to treat the disease costs $1 per dose. $1. So thousands of children will die today because they can't afford a dollar's worth of antibiotics. And more thousands will die from diarrhea and dehydration because their parents don't know how to treat them with just a very simple remedy of sugar, salt, and water that cost only a few cents. And I haven't even started counting the drought and famines across the world, the areas of violence where people suffer needlessly. Now, on the other end, you remember that Charles was crowned king recently? Brian, Karen, do you all remember that? Yeah. I hear they were front row attenders. They estimate that the coronation ceremonies cost almost $150 million to crown Charles King. A guy named Robert Kelly a few years ago lost his job as a CEO of a big bank in New York. He was forced out of his job because he did a terrible job for the bank. And on the way out of the door, they paid him $17 million just to leave. Qantas Airlines lost $200 million one year. They gave their CEO a 71% salary raise. Nearly a billion people on the planet are undernourished every day. They don't have enough to eat. Makes me wonder, it's not that there's too many poor people. It's that the resources are in the wrong place. It's a story that says the world can support millionaires and billionaires, but can't come up with a dollar's worth of antibiotic for a kid in need. It's a world full of goats. Now, C.S. Lewis, speaking about this passage in particular, remember that author wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He said, when we get to heaven, there'll be three surprises. First, we'll be surprised by the people we find there. Second, we'll be surprised by the people who aren't there. And third, we'll be surprised that we're there. Jesus seems to say in this passage, if you're looking for me, you'll find me. You'll find me in the sick and the hungry and the thirsty, the naked, those in prison. Folks, think about that. I know a lot of us came here to church. I came to church this morning because I want to find the presence of Christ here in this place. And I do among the people here. But according to the Gospel of Matthew, even more so, Jesus is out there somewhere waiting for us to show up. He's out there in the home where a mother is choosing to either feed her kids or pay the light bill. He's out there with the teenager who's been kicked out of their house and lives on the streets. He's out there with the couple who've got themselves helplessly, hopelessly addicted to meth, and there's no end in sight. He's out there with the single mom or the single dad who work hard all week long and still can't make the rent or buy groceries or keep clothes on the kids. And just like the disciples who ran to the empty tomb on Easter Sunday, The angel is telling us, he's not here. He's out there. 
Jesus teaches us that our love for God would be shown by our love for neighbors and how we live lives of compassion. He talked about the kingdom. And he said over and over that God's kingdom is compassion. And especially in this passage, the kingdom of heaven, the eternal realm of God, means the total realization of compassion. An outbreak not of war or disease or some virus that takes over the world, but a pandemic, an epidemic of compassion. Heaven is not a place we go to. Heaven is compassion. It's not an object. It's not a noun. Heaven is a verb to be lived out among you in your midst, Jesus says. Heaven happens all around us, wherever and whenever compassion is made real. Jesus invites His followers to join with them, to walk without fear, to access a deeper humanity, a broader, fuller spirituality, and a more profound connection to our fellow human beings. And in that, gets us in touch directly with Jesus Himself. And that's why I think that this Matthew 25 is one of the most radical passages in the Gospels, in all the Bible, and maybe the heart of what Jesus came to teach. And why is that? First, there's no dogma in this passage at all. There's nothing to believe about God or believe about Jesus or to believe about the Holy Spirits. You don't have to answer any questions from the catechism or statements of faith. You don't even have to be baptized or take communion or even attend church. In fact, as you read the story, the sheep who attain the ultimate reward in the end don't even recognize Jesus. That's remarkable. Could it be that God's plan includes even non-Christians? That they will also be counted among the sheep? I mean, frankly, I've known some atheists and agnostics who are more compassionate than some Christians I've known. Have you? So that's one thing. Another thing is, and we should always remember that when we feed the hungry, when we cook a meal at the homeless shelter, like next Sun, next Saturday, we build a house or a handicap ramp. When we provide clothing for a family, or when we engage in the process of justice in our city, we're not bringing Christ to other people. That's where we get it wrong. We think, hey, I go to church, I get a measure of Christ's love, and then I take that out. And we think, We're taking dinner to the homeless. We're cooking dinner for the homeless to bring Christ into their lives. But that's not what this story says. The king isn't as present in the one giving the water or the clothing. The king is present already in the one who is in need. Just the opposite. Christ is out there, and if you want to get close to Him, you go out and find Him because He's already with the poor. He's already with the downtrodden. He's already with the oppressed. And we go to them to be changed, not the other way around. If you've ever served, if you've ever been a servant for others, and I think everybody in this room has done some kind of service, if you've ever helped somebody who was down and out, you know the blessings you get from that. You can hear it in the kitchen at United Caring Services or on the mission trips with youth, or even the adult mission trips that I've been on to Back Bay and other places. You can hear it at the Habitat work site. You can hear it in the Hangers program. You can hear it at Grandin. Volunteers who have everything they need in life and want want for nothing, but who say, I get more out of helping than I think I'm giving. You know that feeling. It's the presence of Christ. It's the presence of Christ discovered among those who are in need. You know, a few years ago, the Presbyterian Church nationwide began an initiative called the Matthew 25 Movement. It's a brilliant idea. They're calling on their congregations to make the 
commitment to designate themselves what they call Matthew 25 churches. That is, churches who know that what they do matters to God and how we treat others is important to God. When they welcome others, they welcome Christ. When they bring together people who are divided, they're doing God's reconciling work. When they're called to serve Jesus by contributing to the well-being of the most vulnerable in all societies, they are finding Jesus in those places. From affordable housing, to community gardens, to equitable education, and employment opportunities, to healing from addiction and mental illness, to also enacting policy changes around all those issues, these are what the Matthew 25 churches are committing to doing. Some piece of that. And I wish I had come up with, I wish the UCC had come up with that, really. I'd like to steal it. I'd like to steal it because Jesus is calling us to perform acts of compassion, even ordinary, everyday acts of compassion in our lives. And in so doing, we continue to find Jesus out there among those who are poor, who are beaten down, who are struggling, who are suffering. Maybe we should be a Matthew 25 church anyway even though we're not Presbyterian. Actually, I think St. Peter's is a Matthew 25 church. Think about what you've accomplished in the timeline on the, in the fellowship hall. Well, think about the issues and organizations and, and just basic acts of compassion that St. Peter's has been involved in over its history. You're already living it out. You're a Matthew 25 church. There's a song I was introduced to, to a few years ago that captures the essence of Matthew 25. It's called Dream God's Dream. I'm going to close, and forgive me, I'm going to sing it for you. And here's how it goes. Dream God's dream, Holy Spirit, help us dream of a world where there is justice and where everyone is free to build and grow and love and to simply have enough. The world will change when we dream God's dream. Let us pray. Savior, lead us like a shepherd that we may be your sheep and not the goats. Help us dream of a world where everyone, all eight billion and more of us, has what we need to reach the potential for which you created us. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Amen.